a killing machine, there are few wild beasts to rival these. They reign supreme over most other creatures in their domain. They are fiercely territorial and defended aggressively. One look into the eye of the tiger, or the lion, or the cougar, is a warning. Don't mess with this cat. If you have a survival instinct, you know they have the killer instinct of the big cats. This is a place of contrasts, where the land can be lush with water-drenched beauty, or an arid dust bowl. And gazing across the vast grass plains of Africa, you may expect to see something like this. Herds of animals nibbling at the pastures. Maybe a group of gazelle or zebra keeping one eye on their quest for a meal, the other on the lookout for the one event that could change their seemingly tranquil existence. Wild animals have both threatened and fascinated humans throughout history. Hold, hold my hand, hold. <laughs> Lions were the real stars of the gladiator shows at the Colosseum. It was their performance the bloodthirsty Romans came to see. For their own amusement, the royal courts of Europe kept large wild cats in cages. It was something of a status symbol for the rich and famous. Catching or killing these powerful beasts was considered a sign of success and courage for the great white hunter. The trophies ended up being stuffed and hung on the wall. But maybe the great white hunter has gone too far. Today, there are seven species of big cats, and only the jaguar is not an endangered species. Wild cats continue to be an animal of fascination. These days, cats are kept in captivity, not just to satisfy the curiosity of those who would never dare venture into the African savannah or the jungles of Asia, but for the survival of the cats. Zoos have really changed, especially over the last uh, 50 years. And the, the important thing to offer these animals is the correct environment, lots of enrichment. And we find here, especially at our zoo here, we've got a zoo full of happy animals. They're very sport and well looked after. And you know, these, these cats, our tigers and lions, they're gonna live a good 10 years longer than they would in the wild. Roaming free or born in captivity, they are still powerful, dangerous animals. I've been breeding, working and watching wild animals all my life. I think nothing of playing with a cobra or kissing a crocodile, but I'd think twice about puckering up to a puma or a tiger. Now, they may look like big pussycats, but even though they've been raised in captivity, you can never be 100% sure of their reactions. We have some pretty strict uh, measures that we take to, to keep us as, as safe as possible. Admittedly, these are tigers and they have big teeth and big claws, um, but we use a backup system where we always have someone out here with us. So if I had a problem, one of the guys would help me or vice versa, I hope. And uh, that way, it keeps it as safe as possible for us. Um, you're gonna get bitten and scratched once in a while, um, but hopefully not too often. Tigers work out better for the type of situation that we have here. They're uh, more adaptable to a number of different people. In most storybooks and folklore, the lion is known as the king of the jungle. But in his habitat, there's not a liana or monkey to be found. King of the savannah would be more accurate. 
This is the king of the jungle. Tigers are the largest member of the cat family. The Siberian tiger is the largest, and they can get up over 300, 350 kilos for a male. Uh, these guys are all Bengal tigers, uh, and they're a little bit smaller. Mohan here weighs about 170 kilos. <laughs> tiger by the tail. <laughs> Generally speaking, the tiger is a beast of the forest, temperate and tropical. But it's also the most adaptable in terms of habitat. They survive in the snow in Russia, and it's not out of the question to find them in swampy areas or grasslands, provided they aren't too far from water. Unlike most other cats, tigers are very accomplished swimmers. In 1933, there's a record of a tiger swimming the five-mile distance between the Malaysian mainland to Penang Island. In 1948, it was recorded that in a region of high tiger population in India, tigers would swim a 20-mile wide river. In really hot regions, they love nothing more than to take a cooling dip. Like these tigers at a popular theme park, Dreamworld, in Australia. Tigers are solitary cats, and the male marks and defends his territory rigorously. They used to be found throughout most of southern, eastern, and central Asia with a few in the Middle East. At the beginning of the 21st century, they survive only in scattered pockets. In about 1900, there were about 100,000 tigers. Today we find only 5,000 tigers left in the wild. Uh, there are eight subspecies of tiger. Uh, three are now extinct, and the rest of them are very, very endangered. And if things aren't done very soon, tigers won't exist in the wild anymore. The Bengal tiger is the one with the healthiest numbers. It's found in India and makes up about two-thirds of the world's tiger population. There's a mutation of this subspecies that produces one of the most beautiful coats you'll ever hope to see. A coat to die for. A Mohan hair is essentially a blonde hair, blue-eyed version of the orange cat that you see around. Uh, he's got four offspring, and actually one's white and three are orange, so you can get a mixture of cubs in a litter. Uh, the first white tiger that was captured, that they're all related to somewhere down the track, was back in 1951. The Maharaja of Rewa, uh, on a hunting expedition, uh, killed a tiger and found a cub the next day, and it was the first ti white tiger in captivity, and his name was Mohan, actually, also. Of all the big wild cats, the tiger is the one to have earned the worst reputation for killing people, especially in India. There's a region of mangrove forest known as the Sundarbans on the Bay of Bengal in India. Since the 17th century, the tigers here, more than any other part of the world, have been considered people eaters. This has largely been attributable to the spread of humans in traditional tiger habitat. Tigers will avoid humans in the wild, but where humans compete for resources through hunting, they can become targets. The tiger will use stealth to hunt its prey. It uses the forest to stay invisible. It must get as close to the target as possible, then move up to a full run of up to 45 miles per hour. The prey this time is a waterfowl. Not much more than a mouthful for this tiger, but a kill is a kill. Tigers and the next biggest cat, the lion, would appear to have few fears. They have no predators in the natural food chain, but there is a creature that has threatened them to the point of serious concern. Our continual need for more land has wiped out many species of cats. However, people have been killing lions and tigers for centuries. But if the situation is reversed and a cat kills and eats a human, it becomes a rogue and must be killed. How could you? Are these animals capable of retaliation? Does the ruler of the grass plains have a taste for human flesh? Just about everything an animal does on this planet is linked to survival. Big cats live for about 15 years. 
during this lifespan they have to breed to survive and in order to breed they have to eat. The cat is a carnivore of the highest order and to eat the cat must hunt. Some cats can consume in excess of 40 pounds of meat in a sitting but then it may not eat again for days. But it's the efficiency and power each cat brings to the hunt, like this leopard, that makes them formidable predators. Not only does it have the ability to bring down a beast much larger than itself, but the immense strength to move the carcass to a safe eating spot. For them to compete uh, and to almost push each other to specialize, they will adopt different strategies in predation so that more cats can live on a continent or more species can coexist together. Unfortunately for the leopard, a tiger has caught the scent of the kill and moves in to claim the prize. The leopard is a fierce competitor but at 90 pounds is no match for a 450 pound hungry tiger. But though they have the same basic instincts and physiology, hunting techniques among the big cats vary. Some have a specialization, but there are two basic methods of capture. Some prefer the stalk, run, pounce approach. Cats that climb like the leopard and the cougar, make the most of their hiding spot and employ the ambush technique with great skill. Hunting technique is not always this simple though. Sometimes both methods are used within the same species. In fact, very few species use only one approach. Which method to use on a given situation depends on the prevailing conditions. Well, the lions with their hunting, you know, they believe that's why lions live in a pride, to assist one another, you know, in their hunting methods. They'll stalk their prey, and the others will lay, lie in ambush. So when it's chased around, then they all sort of join in and pounce to bring their prey down. And if you look at what sort of things they like to eat, you know, they're capable of bringing down things as large as cake buffaloes. The majority of big cat hunting is done after dark, when the prey animals are resting and less alert. But that's not a hard and fast rule, and the herbivores with the tender, tasty flesh must always be vigilant. Of all the senses, hearing and sight are the cat's most important when it's hunting time. A cat can hear sounds through a range of about 70 kilohertz. That's three times the highest sensitivity we can hear. A cat can rotate the ear flaps 180 degrees to home in on a sound, to locate just where there might be a source of prey. Cats' eyes aren't just amazing to look at. They have an amazing ability to see things, especially on the horizontal plane. A cursory glance across the grass plains will tell a lioness where she needs to be for the hunt. Because cats generally hunt at night, they've got great low light vision, like most nocturnal animals. In fact, they need only one fifth the amount of light we humans need to see movement. In general layman terms, that means he can operate quite comfortably in one sixth the amount of light we need to see. In the eyes of animals that work in the dark, there's an area behind the retina called the tapetum. It's an iridescent membrane that works like a mirror to bounce more light to the sensor cells of the retina. You may find an Asiatic lion in the Gear Forest National Park of Western India, but you'll be lucky because there are less than 300. But you'll see no tigers in Africa. This is the land of the legendary lion. Lions are different to other felids. Lions are openly social. They live in a pride of four to 40 animals. The male of the species, Panthera leo, is a formidable looking cat. He's the only one with an impressive golden mane, 
which is in its full glory by the time he's five years old. It's thought to have a couple of uses. One being to make him look stronger and more fearsome, just as some lizards have a frill around their neck to fluff up and give their enemies a chance to rethink an attack. The other is linked to the lion's social system. The regal mane is like the tail of a peacock. It's a chick magnet. What lioness could resist such a display of testosterone fed exhibitionism? The ground shaking roar of the lion can be heard up to five miles away. It's the loudest and the most feared sound of the African savanna. But with an average weight of 425 pounds, he is second in stature to the tiger of Asia. You just don't realise how big they are until you get this close. The male or lion looks like he's the boss, and he is, but it's the lionesses that are the core of lion society. They hold it all together. They do most of the hunting and they alone care for the cubs like this little girl here. <laughs> Most of the females are related, they're aunties, they're mums, they're grandmothers to one another. And that's what happens, the females are born to a pride, they stay within the pride. Where the males, by the time they're, say, two and a half years of age, they're, they're sent away by the dominant male. He chases them off because they start to become a threat to dad. The changeover of male tenure to the pride can cause the females some stress. He will only be reproductive during this short time within the proof, and in the biological urge for his genetic prosperity, the incoming male takes what he may see as pretty drastic steps. They'll go out in search of their own territory and pride, and uh, when they do come across that, they have to fight off the dominant male there, and the first thing they're going to do if they win that battle after he leaves or he's killed, is they're going to run around and kill all the cubs that don't belong to them. And because this will bring all the females back in estrus or back in the breeding season and then they can sire their own genes. Once the prey is singled out from the herd, the first stage of the hunt begins. The stalk is slow, graceful and deliberate. The cat moves closer and closer under the cover of vegetation. When she thinks the quarry is within reach, stage two, the attack takes place. Not every attack is that easy, and frequently, especially in open country, the lion has to give chase, and often she is outrun, so she goes home hungry. To give the entire pride better odds for survival, lionesses perform as a team, not only with cub sitting duties, but also in the hunting process. Part of the advantage of social behaviour is uh, obviously things like anting behaviour, looking after somebody else's young, but also uh, spectacular cooperation in hunting and uh, they do coordinate their efforts they do have specific social traditions in predation which are passed down from uh, from one generation to the next and these are routine practices we think that there have been traditions in terms of hunting people 
And one thing that's been documented three times independently in terms of hunting people is to set up a relay system where the, the corpse is transferred from one lion to another who takes it far away. Hunting other prey such as wildebeest or zebra has also been demonstrated to be a cooperative behavior with specific uh, roles by different pride members in terms of securing prey. Just as the cat's capture techniques vary, killing techniques also vary among species and depending upon the size of lunch. More times than not, the prey animals are larger in body size than the cat. This is where the throat bite is mostly used. The lioness's large canine teeth aren't necessarily for ripping, but for killing. With a well-placed bite, she will crush or puncture the trachea and render the animal breathless. Those enormous cat paws will anchor the struggling victim while the specialized array of teeth does its job. The cats have fewer teeth than other carnivores because cats have a shortened jaw to give them that strong, wide bite. Some scientists believe there may be damage to the lower parts of the skull, which affects the central nervous system. The second method the lion uses to kill prey is a bite to the nape of the neck. This is generally only executed on smaller prey animals or animals already on the ground for practicality. Even as a lively red from cub youth of just over 12 months, Mac the lion here gives Rob and Bill a first-hand and unexpected demonstration of the nape bite. The lion bites his prey. <laughs> here we got one here. You all right? Mac, of course, is only play. It's rough play, but if he was serious, Bill would be severely mauled. Hey, hold, hold, hold. But with a firm and knowledgeable hand, it's back to Mac, the pussycat. After a kill, the big cats will start on the hindquarters of the carcass and move on to the entrails. The animals they eat are mostly herbivores and the contents of their stomachs give the cats the vitamins they need. Most of their water requirements come from food, but all cats will certainly drink when water is available. Here, a pride of Asiatic lionesses and older cubs vigorously fight over a kill. The male comes to dinner late, but demands his rights to eat first. Traditionally, the males will eat first, followed by the lionesses, and finally, the cubs. In this case, the female is forced to kill again for her growing cubs. No wonder the saying goes, the lion's share. Lions are the ruling predator of the savannah, but lion cubs can become targets too. Some cubs have been separated from the pride, and acting as if in natural retribution, a herd of Cape buffalo picks up the scent of one of the cubs and attacks it. Defiant to the end, the cub gives a stinging bite to the overpowering buffalo, which then deals the death blow. This is a plain example the killer instinct. The most famous and perhaps the most mysterious case of lions eating humans occurred more than 100 years ago. The tragedies at Tsavo in Kenya have left a lot of unanswered questions. The year was 1898 and the railway from Mombasa to Uganda was being built. A bridge needed to be constructed at Tsavo by engineer Lieutenant Colonel John Patterson. A thousand men, mainly from India, were the workers 
They lived in open tents on the plains of Kenya. Shortly after Patterson's arrival in Savo in 1898, uh, people, uh, including the Indian workers employed from India as well as African native workers, started to disappear. And it was uh, rapidly uh, very apparent that these lions, that people were being consumed by lions, man-eating lions. In a span of about eight months, they're thought to have killed, according to uh, Patterson, over 20 Indian workers and several scores, meaning up to 100 other workers. A total of, we think, over 100 people were killed. The workers believed these lions to be the embodiment of evil and were frightened out of their wits. They also believed the lions were taking men for enjoyment rather than food. But there was a bizarre twist to the story of Tsavo. In 1914, Patterson wrote about his African experience. I came upon a fearsome looking cave which seemed to run back for a considerable distance under the rocky bank. Round the entrance and inside the cavern, I was thunderstruck to find a number of human bones, with here and there a copper bangle such as the natives wear. Beyond all doubt, the man-eater's den. Yeah, my colleague Tom Noski and I and a great Kenyan colleague Samuel Andanje from Kenya Wildlife Service uh, made up our minds we should look for the so-called den of the man-eaters of Savo. We found the cave uh, very close to the railway bridge. All human bones had been washed out probably within uh, the next time it rained after Cat Patterson uh, discovered the cave. John Patterson tracked down the two lions and killed them. Their skins and skulls are now in the Field Museum in Chicago. Were the Tsavo lions evil creatures with a taste for human flesh? Or were they just trying to survive? What made these lions different? We also know that the railway was built along a traditional Swahili caravan route um, and crossed the river at the same place. They had been resting at this spot for, for, uh, for perhaps centuries, and this was a routine lion hunting ground. There was one other mitigating factor in the Tsavo lion's defense. The tooth of the notorious first man-eater, which we see right here, had a severely broken uh, lower right canine, which is actually growing horizontally as opposed to vertically. His main killing tool was out of action, so maybe he had a bad temper brought on by a bad toothache. The interesting thing about man-eating is people think this is a thing of the past from the 19th century or the 20th century for that matter. Man-eating is still a very serious problem today in Zambia in 1991, former Chicagoan Wayne Hosek shot and killed a lion we see in our, in our building named the Maneater of Mapue. And this lion had killed six people before it was killed that it even had the audacity to parade around town with uh, a clothes bag uh, from some of its victims. We do think that th these are traditions and cultures, and uh, that human is simply another species on the landscape. We have evidence from the fossil record that humans have been the victim of lions and leopards, for that matter, for uh, several million years. And virtually most of our knowledge of early human evolution is from the layers of leopards and hyenas and that sort of thing. Lions are naturally curious, but do they want to eat us? If there was a test to prove that, then this may be it. An experiment by a drive through Wildlife Park was prompted after several people were found breaking park rules. People get out and they open the bonnet and just see what's happened to their car, which is, of course, very dangerous. We have had the odd person get out and want to go to the toilet behind a tree in an emergency. Um, we even had a party a few years ago get all their things out and, and, and attempt a picnic in the lion reserve. Store dummies were set up around a car. The lions are cautious, but go straight for the human-looking dummies.
The results from this startling test tightened up park rules considerably. Coming up, mountain lion, puma, cougar. Three names, one powerful, smart, sometimes unpopular cat. From the grass plains of Africa, where the largest and most dangerous animals roam, we travel to the Americas, where the human population are probably more dangerous to the animals than they are to us. The American mountain lion is named for its resemblance to the big cat of Africa. The mountain lion is a much smaller cat. Body weight would be half to one third that of the African lion. Coat color varies according to habitat. This is one very adaptable animal, perhaps more so than the tiger. From Canada to the tip of the South American continent, they seem happy and adaptable to a range of climates, which may go some way to explain why it is a cat of many names. Whether you call it an American mountain lion, a puma, a cougar or a panther, it doesn't matter. It's the same cat. I'm going to call it a cougar. Within a couple of hundred years of European colonization, the cougar was virtually gone from its eastern range of North America. Only two critically endangered subspecies, the eastern cougar and the Florida panther, are left. Described as shy and elusive, the cougar lives a solitary life and far prefers to avoid contact with anything other than a potential meal or mate. In a healthy food chain, cougars are at the top, keeping a balance of wildlife populations. When our territories overlap, cougars sometimes take livestock and pets. And you can imagine how happy that makes the people concerned. Well, the puma, also known as the, the cougar or mountain lion, actually were killed off as pests uh, back in the earlier days because of coming down into the farmer's land, taking the domestic stock and, and being a bit of a nuisance. The cougar is a supreme predator and works by the cover of low light at dawn and again at dusk. As with the other cats, daytime hunting expeditions are not unknown. Cougars will quietly stalk their prey, always undercover to ensure the element of surprise. Once close enough, they pounce. This is a cat of remarkable jumping finesse. Because the cougar is such a good climber and so good at propelling its body forwards in an attack, it will sometimes launch an attack from above. The cougar may be a formidable opponent, but it does not have the same superiority and stature as the African lion. These cats are designed as sight feeders, as opposed to scent feeders. They will scale cliffs and scan the area below for prey. They are known to have large territories from 16 to 85 square miles. And when there is plenty of food, cougars will often play before making the kill. Yeah, well, its main diet, it likes to prey on smaller things like small deer, uh, rodents, hares, uh, raccoons even. But, you know, they have this what's called an extended stomach, which enables them to actually gorge themselves and fill their bellies, and probably anywhere up to maybe 30 kilos of meat at one sitting. This is the reason for the cougar's success as a species. It's an opportunistic hunter, and they're not picky when it comes to survival.
really don't like confrontation with humans. They're more, they're a very elusive cat. They'd be more inclined to run away than to approach someone. I think the problems they've had uh, in America with, with them attacking humans is due to the fact that a lot of these cats that are out there have once been people's pets and they've been let go when they've become unmanageable. Because, you know, they're really cute and cuddly when they're little. You know, puma cubs, covered in little spots, blue eyes, gorgeous. You know, make great presents. But they soon grow very quickly. And, you know, you can never tame or domesticate an animal like that. It's wild by nature. In the last 100 years, there have been 13 fatal cougar attacks on the North American continent. A number that may be regarded as low, but evidence that this relatively small cat means business. It's well equipped to survive. Sally and Bill Pady run the Mogo Zoo in Australia and well know the unpredictability of a cougar. Rob's encounters with their wilder than usual pet Thomas here relied on the fact that Rob couldn't look Thomas in the eye. That would constitute a challenge. It's a precaution that the Pades have learned to deal with when it's just another night at home in front of the television. Reared from a kitten, Thomas assigns trust to his keepers, but even they know Thomas is, at heart, a wild and largely unpredictable animal. Although in their hands you'd never know it. On the vast plains of the Serengeti, the mighty Panthera Leo lives side by side with the lithe, graceful cat of another genus. Asinonyx jubatus, the cheetah. The cheetah is the oldest species and the smallest of the big cats. It's also the fastest land animal. It can outperform most modern sports cars in terms of speed of acceleration. A fully grown cheetah can reach its top speed of 70 miles per hour in around three seconds from a standstill. But unlike the high performance sports car, this high performance cat can only maintain a top speed for a short distance, three, maybe 400 yards. You know, this African speed demon can shoot you that cat look of defiance. But by big cat standards, the cheetah's the shy guy. In an unplanned encounter, It'll probably do what it does best, and that's run. Prey surveyed from a high vantage point won't be let off so lightly. If you're the cheetah's favourite food, in this area that's the impala, then you're no match for the fastest animal on four lean, graceful legs. Yeah, there's, there's two things quite unique about cheetahs. One is that they are the fastest land animal on the earth. And the others, they're the only member of the cat family whose claws don't retract. They stay out, a lot like a dog. Now, this is to enable them, obviously, to be able to run very fast, and they've been clocked at uh, some top speeds near 100 kilometres an hour. So they don't hunt like the lions do, for, for instance. They don't, they're not stalking cats. What they do, they'll lie in wait or in ambush, and then they'll use that sheer speed to outrun their prey and a little trip of the back leg and brings the prey straight down. Cheetahs hunt by day while other predators are resting. Females hunt alone, males in groups of related males. Both use the neck bite method of killing. The female cheetah uses the bush as cover. She will get as close as she can, then accelerate for the kill. The cheetah's huge burst of energy for the rundown tires the slender cat and will often now rest to regain its strength. While the cheetah is catching a breath, it isn't unusual for a cheeky scavenger to snatch away the fruits of the cat's labour. The shy cheetah is easily persuaded to give up its catch. Dragging the carcass to a safe place is one way to ensure a peaceful meal. The lifestyle of the female cheetah is totally different to the male. She lives alone, rearing her cubs. She's not territorial, and her range often overlaps that of another female. The males are totally different. 
The easy way to tell a cheetah from a leopard is from the teardrop markings on its face. It's also much leaner than others. The curved spine is also a giveaway, and the cheetah can't roar. It chirps like a bird. Apart from a mother protecting her cubs, cheetahs don't seem to be a very aggressive cat. Attacks on humans are extremely rare. Cheetahs are extinct in the wild outside Africa. Once there were populations from India to the Middle East and down through the African continent. Now they're only found on the grasslands and plains of East and Central Africa. Big cats are both powerful and aggressive when they have to be for survival and beautiful. So beautiful, in fact, they have often become the hunted more than the hunter. In some countries, the pelt of a wild cat is worth six months wages. A strong incentive to become a killer. Animals can be victims of their own success. And for example, a tiger with its spectacular stripe pattern extremely attractive aesthetically to humans, but it also gives them a unique way to blend into the forests which they live in, in Asia. The place of zoos has, has really changed in the last 50 years, creating better environments for the animals and for the public as well. To be able to experience an animal such as a tiger, really up close and personal. Now, Thelma. Oh, very good. Yeah, very big. If we think about the, the present trends of the poaching and the habitat loss, we're going to lose these tigers in about 15 more years. Now the ones that have already gone extinct, there's none, not even in zoos. The only place you're ever going to see them is in picture books. Now we don't want that to happen to the remaining subspecies, so it's very important that we have these captive breeding programs to, to ma maintain them. Are you going to talk to me? Oh, good girl, good girl. Very good. But even the king, the lion, has to be wary of other animals in his own territory. Giraffe can sometimes kill a lion. They can hit him with their heads. They got huge feet and they can kick pretty well also. It seems that no matter what the cause of the big wild cat's disappearance, it can be traced to us. <laughs> We invade their territories and take away their food. Where populations become isolated into a small pocket, surrounded by human development, inbreeding becomes a threat to their future. There are instances when they turn on people, causing serious injury or the ultimate sin, devouring the body. This is when men seek revenge. But revenge for what? The cat was simply surviving the best way it could under the circumstances. Of all the big cats, the snow leopard is the most endangered. And it's places like here at the Mogo Zoo where they're gonna get a second chance. For the first time in a decade in all of Australasia, They've been bred here. The mountains of Central Asia are the home of the snow leopard, but the primary threat to their survival in the wild is intense human population growth. Let's hope we continue to be thankful that we live in a time when these beautiful animals and many others like them still roam the earth. Few countries in the 21st century can still claim to have big cats roaming free in their natural habitat. True animal lovers may have once frowned upon zoos, but the role of zoos has changed considerably. I'm Rob Brettle. Thanks for joining us on Killer Instinct.